So my name is Susan Raymond and I work at Equine Guelph and I'll tell you a little bit briefly about Equine Guelph for those of you that maybe aren't as aware. So yeah, so I'm gonna be focusing on uh, fire prevention and emergency preparedness, focusing on for horse owners. Summary of this morning's presentation, we're gonna look at, uh, I might spend the bulk of the lecture on fire prevention um, because that's something that is really important for anybody involved with horses, whether you own the farm that you have your horse at or if you're a boarder, um, it's a really important thing to focus on. And I'm also gonna talk a bit about emergency preparedness in general, uh, looking at, as I mentioned, our responsibilities, um, whether you're a horse owner or uh, even if you don't own a horse, but you care for horses or you ride or you part board, anybody involved with caring for the horse has some responsibilities. And I wanna make sure that you're aware of the opportunities that you have through uh, Equine Guelph, which is right on campus. So Equine Guelph, we are located on McGilvery Street, uh, the corner of McGilvery and Smith Lane. So it's the Equine, I forget what it's called now, the Reproductive and Sports Medicine Center, I think. Um, so I think the BBRM horses are there. And yes, and our offices are just in the building. Um, and then we have some of our, both our large animal rescue and some of our Equimania displays are stored in the back as well. So we're basically, we're the horse owner center at the University of Guelph. Um, and we focus on education and training, uh, focused on for the horse industry. We opened in 2003. And um, as I said, we're governed by or overseen by horse industry, industry groups, both racing and non-racing. And we don't focus on any sort of breed or sport discipline. Um, education. We focus on general health and well-being of horses overall, and also safety uh, of people that are working with horses. Uh, we have, as was mentioned, we do a lot of online education. Um, we started actually in 2002, the year before we actually opened up, um, in terms of our 12-week courses. We have 12-week courses that are online. Uh, they can be built towards taken, they could be taken as individual courses, but they can be built towards um, either a diploma program or um, a certificate. And then we also have a new horse portal, um, which we focus on short online courses. The short online courses could be one week in length, two weeks, and some of them are on demand. So it's just really looking at flexible learning. So what's in an emergency? Um, an emergency can, is really up to uh, the perception of the person involved with the animal. So it could be something really small, um, a very affecting one horse, say one horse in one farm or one horse in one predicament, or it could affect a whole farm or something much larger, for example, a wildfire. So as we've mentioned, a horse owner, as horse owners or caregivers, it's your responsibility to plan before the event occurs. So some of the responsibilities that we as involved with horses, um, having a trained horse right from the start, spending some effort in training your horse is really important. Um, so things like being able to load your horse onto a trailer, uh, a horse being able to load in a variety of types of trailers, um, being able to work with a veterinarian uh, or, or a farrier. So having your horse being able to accept uh, you know, blood work or vaccinations or just, you know, health care. Um, so having a trained horse is one that you can catch from the field is always a good one too. Um, so spending effort up front on training your horse is important. Um, other responsibilities include looking at your farm. So farm safety or stable safety, um, trailer safety, a big one, of course, is fire prevention, looking at emergency preparedness in a broader way, uh, looking at infectious disease prevention, so in terms of biosecurity on your horse farm, and overall risk assessments um, in your day-to-day -day management. So fire prevention for horse farms, as I said, that's one of the areas that I think is really important for horse owners to be involved with. Um, and I'll just point out this, this picture was actually 
part of our, um, some of the other things that I'm involved in is, is training for first responders. So this horse uh, went in and out of that burning barn uh, a few times that day. So this is actually a training um, scenario. So the, the firefighters, a lot of them haven't handled um, large animals before. So, and of course, a lot of horses haven't seen firefighters in full gear before. So having some sort of training is, is excellent. Um, but yeah, so that's not a, that's a mock-up picture in terms of our training. So in terms of fire prevention, some of the goals for this morning, we're going to look at fire safety itself, um, fire behavior basics, looking at the focus mainly on fire prevention. Um, if a fire has occurred, how you can best assist the first responders yeah, when they're arriving on site. And uh, talking a little bit about some further resources and education um, opportunities that are available for you. So the ultimate goal, of course, is that you are the first line of defense um, in terms of preventing fires from occurring on your farm. Three lines of defense for looking at fire safety. The most important one is education and prevention. So, of course, if you are able to prevent it from occurring, then you're not going to have the fire, obviously. Uh, the second line is inspection and enforcement. Uh, and then the, the last line of defense is the fire has started, so uh, the first responders have to suppress it and try to put it out. Education and prevention really is the most important part of these, these lines of defense. It's proactive, so it's, it's, again, you have the power to make a difference up front. It directly involves you as the horse owner or the farm owner. And it really is the most effective way to deal with the fire because, again, it's prevention. Looking at inspection or enforcement, uh, that's a combination of proactive and reactive. And really, um, most of our agricultural buildings, except for if they're very, very large and in more industrial buildings, they are exempt from most fire codes. Um, so there isn't a lot of inspection or enforcement that can occur. And again, uh, fire suppression is 100% reactive. If we look at um, the fire growth in terms of when a fire starts, um, so say at the very beginning of you know, zero time, there's an ignition, um, and this shows just how fast a fire can grow in terms of square feet. And if we look at, uh, this is the response time for a fire department. Um, so the ignition of the fire, uh, you know, after two minutes might be noticed and it's reported, and you can see how long it takes for a fire department actually to possibly respond, depending on um, if it's a volunteer fire department and the time it takes for them to actually get to the fire um, station and then actually to get to your farm. So you can see that uh, by the time they're actually might be doing something, you know, the fire has qu spread quite a bit. So during a barn fire, obviously time is against you. Um, when we look at our farms, if we look at what a farm is, the setup of a farm, it's you can see it's very easy um, in terms of fires to spread. So most of our stables are made up of wood. Um, they could be very large open buildings. Um, there could be some electrical safety issues. And then what we have in stables. So we feed our horses, obviously, hay. Um, they are usually on bedding, so it could be straw or shavings, and feed and bedding are highly combustible, um, and they burn with a heat similar to gasoline. So you've, you've got a, you can see that a, a barn can be um, really problematic in terms of, you know, being able to support a fire. And then um, in terms of animals that are in the barn, um, it, injury can occur very rapidly. Of course, either injury or suffocation um, through smoke damage. So again, fire prevention starts with you. Um, some of the things looking at fire prevention, uh, you can look at what kind of trades people that you have coming into your barn. Um, so in terms of the farriers, uh, any other work that's being done, um, what tools are being used by the trades people. So in terms of propane torches, uh, fans, um, having a no smoking policy. Um, this is important, especially if it is 
a boarding stable or a stable, a lot of racing stables. Um, the different trainers have a number of stalls and then they're responsible for the management of the stalls and, the, and also the employees coming in. So an average, more of a, an industry farm could have so many people coming in and off that property. So it's very important to decide if you're going to have um, in terms of no smoking policy and how um, that's going to be communicated. We use a lot of fans, especially in summertime, to cool down our horses. So looking at the kind of fans that you're using, um, you really need to use a fan that's meant for agricultural purposes or more industrial. Um, a fan also, wherever it's plugged in, think about if it could fall over. Or I've seen in some stables where a fan or a heater might be on a plastic chair um, you know, and then plugged in using zip ties and just really look at how you're, you're managing um, the tools that you're using. Um, I said earlier that uh, more of an uh, industrial type fan that's approved for what they call hazardous atmospheres. So barns obviously have a lot of dust and um, debris. So having something that is safe to use in that kind of environment is the way to go in terms of fan use. Same with any sort of heating. So whether it's heaters or if we're trying to um, heat the water for our, our water buckets, having something that is meant to be um, actually plugged in um, and built in, not something that is a homemade type of a system. Um, it really has to be meant for that use um, and, and designed for that use. Um, uh, electricity, so electrical use is one of the um, largest sources of fires and stables. So having either uh, the electrical lights that are not um, put in properly. Sorry, I'm just moving my cat away from my coffee. <laughs> um, sorry, he's going to knock it over. So having electrical lights um, that are not fastened properly. So you see this one is hanging from the ceiling. Um, they really should be encased uh, in a glass shield or metal housing. A big thing is extension cords. And I can't see everybody who's in the class today, but um, extension cords are not to be used as permanent wiring. So when you go into your barn tonight or a barn that you have access to, take a look at if, if there are any extension cords running, um, they really are meant for temporary use. So if you're going to be using clippers or just doing something, you use an extension cord. If you have an extension cord that's uh, set up on a more regular basis, that indicates that really there should be an electrical outlet installed somewhere so that you can directly plug in whatever you're plugging in and, and really the extension cords are not to be used that way. The other thing is that um, your extension cords, if you're using them and they're plugged in, they shouldn't be coiled. Um, they should be strung out straight. Um, so I should get a picture of that because that's an important point. So if they are in a bundle um, and if there's any issue, there can be a lot more heat that's generated uh, that passes from between the, like if there is any um, point of weakness or, or um, if there's a break. Um, so really, if you have a plugged in extension cord, if you're going to be doing that, it should be strung out and not in a coil. They also shouldn't be hanging on things like nails or hooks that, that can cause um, wear and fray. Um, so look at if and that goes for any sort of wiring. Important point about looking at the wiring in your barn, um, it should be in conduit so the you know, mice don't chew it, um, it shouldn't be open wires, um, and make sure that you have a qualified electrician check out the elect electrical system in your barn, because that really is, if you talk, I think you mentioned you talked to insurance, electrical um, issues in stables is the number one cause of fires. So looking at, the other thing I mentioned was things on our barn, hay and straw um, or shavings, um, where do we store that? So I know in this area, we have a lot of bank barns or old dairy barns uh, with lofts systems. We do have a lot of lofts that have 
that we store our bedding and our hay. Um, best practice is that it is actually stored in a separate building from where the horses are kept. Um, so that may not always be practical, but um, looking at some kind of building for the bulk of your uh, hay and bedding, and then just keep um, a smaller supply in the stable um, that can be used up, but the, the large loads shouldn't be in the same building as where you house your horses. Um, there is some interest in terms of detection and protection in terms of smoke detectors and heat detectors. Um, uh, in some larger barns, there could be sprinkler systems. Uh, these can be used, um, but they there's some issues with some of our smoke detectors and heat detectors in that the barn is such a environment of, again, high dust. They, um, If you're interested in something like this, you have to do a little bit of homework in terms of what is actually practical for a barn system. Um, it's almost better to make sure you do all of your better housekeeping prevention uh, before relying on something like this. It's different than in a home system um, in terms of the smoke detectors and heat detectors. So part of fire prevention obviously is using fire extinguishers. Um, so again, next time you're at the barn that you go to, uh, one, is there a fire extinguisher in the barn? Um, do you know where it is? Uh, there should be more than one. They ideally that they are at the barn entrances or exits. Um, and the other thing is, do you know how to use one if um, if you have to? Um, there, there could be a situation where you could have your fire department come out and actually do training, um, depending on you know that the, the department that you have access to, they might be willing to come out and do training for your barn, um, and then everybody can use fire extinguishers. Um, and then building construction, um, a lot of our barns are very open and we want that in terms of both um, improving ventilation and allowing more so socialization from horses to be able to see each other from stall to stall, but a very open concept uh, building burns a lot faster. Um, I mean, you've probably heard of, uh, you know, we, we're always told to close doors. Um, so it's called compartmentalization. So if you have a fire in one area, if there are closed doors, even if they're not fireproof doors, it's gonna slow the spread. So a lot of our barns are very open. So that's um, you know a cause of, of fire spread. Um, I, I have the picture of this one. So this isn't, again, typical, especially in our area, but in terms of a best practice, being able to get the horses out of a barn, these one, this shows an example of the stall doors. Each stall has an exterior door. Um, so in terms of a best practice, in terms of being able to get horses out, um, this is, is an ideal, even though it's, I know it's not very common. So that brings me to evacuation. Um, when you're evacuating horses, again, you have to think ahead of time how, um, how you might do that in the barn that you're actually working in. So probably a lot of our stalls don't have their own exterior doors. So you're going to have to decide how the best way is to get the horses out. Um, and the other important point is in an emergency, once you get them out, you can't let them loose. Um, one, it, it is true that they do run back into barns, um, livestock and horses. You know, you've heard that they consider that they're safe place. And so they will run back into a burning barn. The other thing is if there are fire um, responders coming to your property in vehicles, you don't want to have loose horses running around um, where a truck can hit them, especially at nighttime. So if you're removing animals, they have to be secured somewhere. So you have to plan ahead of time, um, have a secure spot for them to be, to, for you to put them so that they're not loose um, and have a plan, especially if you have a facility where say it's a bunch of horses and then one one stallion you got to have a plan for where you're going to put a stallion versus putting them into the paddock with everybody else so just having some some ideas ahead of time what you're going to do um, is a good idea making sure that the people everybody knows what the plan is so again this can be 
uh, quite challenging if it's a boarding facility or a lesson barn, uh, making sure that everybody ahead of time knows what the plan is, um, because you don't know who's going to be actually at your facility when a fire occurs. It could be somebody who's you know new to the facility is coming in for a lesson. You know, so I think up front there has to be that conversation about what happens in the emergency um, and what the plan is. So how to best assist you, um, sorry, how to best assist the fire department if they are going to arrive on site. So the best thing is to, is to introduce yourself before an issue and create a pre-plan with them. Um, so I had mentioned earlier, perhaps you could have some training opportunities, either you go out to the department or the department comes to your barn. Um, they might do a walk through your facility and just, um, point out some things of uh, concern. Uh, they might be able to do some fire extinguisher training. Um, and you might be able to reciprocate by if they're interested in handling horses. Um, again, some of our firefighters have never handled um, cows and horses before. So, you know, you might be able to do some sort of training, cross training. And wouldn't it be great if, you know, the first time the firefighters are coming to your property is not during an emergency. Um, that'd be like the ideal scenario. Um, so if a fire has occurred, another point is knowing your farm address. So it's easy to say you know what it is, but in an emergency situation, you may not be thinking clearly. Um, and also the people that are helping may not know the farm address. So the best thing is to have it written down somewhere. Uh, it's very visible. Um, I know a lot of farms may not have landlines anymore, and you, we might be relying on our cell phones, but making sure that, again, it's known that it's in whatever spot, very easy, this is the farm address, so that, um, you know, you're, the whoever is reporting it can do it very easily. Um, uh, the fire department number, well, usually you'll be calling 911, but it, you know, you could also know your local department too. Um, making sure you have somebody meet the fire department at the road is best. There are some larger properties that have more than one entrance to a farm. So you want to make sure to direct them to the right spot. So having somebody at meeting them at the road, because then you can also give direction on uh, where is the best place for them to park or which building it is or which, you know, again, if it's a larger facility with multiple entrances, just making it really user friendly and, and easy for them. Ahead of time, taking a look at your property to evaluate it. So the roadway or driveway is clear. Is it um, large enough to allow a fire truck to come down it um, in terms of the width, uh, overhanging branches? Um, you know, is it, uh, is the truck gonna be able to get through? Uh, and not take out all of your trees in the, in the meantime. Um, and the, the, the grading of the driveway, is it um, something that is, is firm enough and strong enough to withstand, or is it full of potholes and mud? And, and just looking at it from the perspective of a large truck coming down or more than one truck coming down. And then depending on the season, um, snow, ice, other barriers, uh, fallen down trees, check it, just again, making sure that it's easy. I said earlier about uh, evaluating your property in terms of multiple buildings and locations. Um, so this is really important. And, and especially again, with some of the larger racing stables, there have been, there have been problems of um, when there's a barn fire, making sure that the responders can get to the right spot. Um, so making sure to give the right lo location to the, when you call 911, and again, um, having a staff person or somebody at the entrance. And depending on the call, being prepared for multiple fire departments to arrive. Um, so, you, so you might have a lot of different trucks coming and responding. Um, so looking at, again, ahead of time, identifying, this is for farm safety, looking at if you have potential hazards around your barns, so where, where you're storing things, um, making sure to keep combustible objects uh, away from farms um, and also vehicles. So when you look at parking, are you 
uh, parking all the cars and trucks in a spot which is going to hamper a first responder's response. So maybe looking at, and again, I know these are best practice um, ideas. A lot of our farms, you may not have a lot of options on how much land and where you can park, but maybe just give some thought about if everybody's vehicle is blocking everything, what happens if an emergency vehicle has to come down that lane? And looking at where we store our tractors and trailers and, um, and farm trucks, um, making sure again, they're not gonna be uh, a hindrance. Fuel tanks, making sure that they are not stored near uh, stables. Um, and also looking at our barns, a lot of our older barns might have a lot of different doorways, making sure that all the doorways, the doors are actually working. Um, there's a lot of old barns that we might do different things where we might have put a bunch of um, store tack boxes in front of it or lock a door. And, and again, in an emergency situation, you wanna make sure all the doorways are working properly uh, from both inside and out. And again, there might be people there that have never been to your farm before. And, and isn't it a shame if they're trying to open a door that you know nobody uses, but it should be in working order. So if uh, a problem has occurred, emergency has occurred, um, having a pre-plan ahead of time is really important. So especially our facilities where we have a lot of people going in and out of them. Um, so knowing ahead of time, is there somebody in the barn? Uh, knowing how many people are on site is important. Um, was there a fire plan and was it executed properly? Do, how, do you account for everybody? Um, understand the barn design. Again, some of our farms have multiple doors and multiple buildings. Um, just having a good idea of the farm structure. Knowing what's, oh yes, hand up. Yeah, sorry. How do you keep track of how many people are on site? If it's a large barn with many borders, do you have a sign up sheet system or what's the best practice? Yeah, I mean, the best practice is to, yes, no, if it's very, very busy, then a sign-in sheet would be best. Um, having, if it's a smaller one, then just having a really good idea of um, if it's, you know, if it's lessons. Um, yeah, having some sort of, I, I think you have to see what works best in your situation, but a sign-up sheet or having, knowing what's was typical of, of that day, um, it, it can be very challenging. Yeah, very. Um, looking at the inventory of your barn, um, knowing what's inside. So in terms of if that barn has livestock or if you're also storing other things, ideally you shouldn't store them in the barn, but knowing what's there in terms of fertilizers, um, other chemicals, paints, like anything, just knowing what's there and, and perhaps making sure it's, it's actually not in the same facility with the live animals. Looking at, um, uh, again, this is another reason why to reach out to your fire department ahead of time. Um, knowing how first responders um, approach a situation, they use what's called the incident command system. And that's where one person is actually in charge. Uh, that's the incident commander. So if you do have uh, an emergency and you want to talk to somebody, find out. Basically, you look, look for the person in the white hat. That's the, the like sort of an easy way to do it. Look for the white hat person um, or the white helmet. Um, but you ask somebody who you can talk to because you're, you're not going to be helpful if you're, um, uh, I guess, trying to control the situation too much or trying to get in the way or trying to talk to too many people. You need to talk to the person in charge and then it can go from there. But knowing that system ahead of time is important. And of course, if there is a problem, a barn fire at your stable, um, you want to make sure that you allow the first responders to do their job and you help them and, and you're, not, you're not putting yourself in harm's way. Um, 
they are going to, of course, look after you if you're in trouble before they would look after your horse. So making sure that people are safe is, is a priority. Um, so don't be a hero. Um, make sure that you respect uh, their system um, and you have to let them do their job um, and, and uh, make sure that you, you're not part of the problem. And as we say, common sense is not so common. Um, if there is a fire, make sure that you get out, stay out. Uh, and also an important point when I've talked to a lot of different first responders is don't be afraid to call 911. Um, if you think it's a teeny tiny thing and you can handle it yourself, it, don't hesitate to call 911. Um, it, it don't, don't feel that you're wasting their time or um, that you can't handle it. I think emergencies can get out of hand very quickly. So just um, the message that I received from most of these first responders is, is don't hesitate, just, just call. Um, you're better off to call. They'd rather um, respond to something that is much smaller than you not to call and then it becomes much bigger. Any questions about fire prevention? You can, again, ask throughout it, um, but yeah. we'll move on. Oh, yes? I don't see anything okay. in the chat or anywhere. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to a bit broader in terms of emergency preparedness in, in other areas. Um, so, of course, uh, this is still going on, but emergency preparedness looking at a pandemic, um, how... And we, we've seen a lot of different, very inventive ways of, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, of trying to deal with the situation which we never thought we would ever be in. Um, other examples of broader um, emergencies, of course, are fire, but looking at instead of an individual barn fire, looking at um, uh, wildfires. And of course, different weather patterns, uh, depending on what area you're in and where you're located. Severe weather could be uh, floods, um, ice and winter storms, heat, um, tornadoes, hurricanes, it just really a lot of variety. Um, so an important thing is uh, knowing what is possible in your area um, and doing a bit of homework in terms of flooding where you are situated compared to a river or um, you know if it's a high wind area, any sort of thing. Um, ahead of time is, is a good idea. So looking at um, business continuity, we, we a lot of stables had some trouble with this, um, especially at the earlier the, at the pandemic is, and, and this can be the true, true for non-pandemic times too, is how is your stable going to operate in an emergency situation? So not, and I'm not talking about a barn fire, but just if something happens that uh, affects day-to-day -day operations, knowing how your business is going to operate in terms of hoops. So it could be something like um, who's going to be able to get to feed and water the horses if something has happened. Um, so say it could be the, the, the person who always does it is sick or injured. Um, what's the backup plan? Uh, say it's a large ice storm or power outage and the people don't live on site and like just how how is the, the stable going to operate um, if there is a, an emergency situation. So looking at do you have your own emergency response plan? Um, there is a good website, it's a federal one, so it's getprepared.ca. Um, so you have to look at how you're going to prepare for an emergency for yourself before you can look at for the animals that are under your care. Um, so looking at, are you prepared for yourself, your small animals, if you care for large animals? Um, in terms of planning for an emergency, as I said, know the risks up front. So know what is possible in your area, what you have to plan for, make a plan and then get a kit so the kit can be an individual kit for yourself or your family, and then looking at broader what you have to have um, to care for your small animals and then your large animals. 
So looking at uh, fire uh, in terms of um, fires that have occurred on, on property. Um, afterwards, you have to, of course, look at replace what's lost. So have a plan for how you're going to replace structures or equipment. Um, if a fire is, so a wildfire um, is occurring, have a plan in place if you're going to sh what's called shelter in place, if you're going to keep the animals there on site um, and you know what's the best way to do that, or if you're going to evacuate. Um, so in terms of evacuating, that's why, again, it's important that your horse can trailer, that your horse can go into a trailer. Uh, a lot of our properties, we, we may not have enough trailers for all of our horses, right? A lot of times. So then having some kind of plan in place, um, maybe having some uh, prearranged agreements with friends. So if there's an emergency on their property, you're going to go with your truck and trailer or vice versa. So having some kind of plan in place ahead of time, and then having an idea of where you could go with your animals. Um, so whether again, if it's a friend or some kind of agreement or in a larger emergency, it could be something like, uh, you know, um, a municipality might set up something at a fairgrounds or, you know, maybe a racetrack or like just having an idea of, of what, could be the possibilities of where you could bring your animals um, in an emergency. So again, Annie's, the theme of the day is prevention and I guess pre-planning. So again, looking at with severe weather, knowing what's possible in your location. Um, so pre-planning, um, having a plan, an evacuation or shelter plan uh, for the animals, and then also for the people, of course, that are, are, are uh, working or, or being at that facility. So again, planning ahead of time. With severe weather, a big one is loss of power. So having an idea of what's gonna happen if there is no power. Um, if you're gonna have backup gener generators, uh, if you're gonna have a sufficient way to keep the generators going. Um, a big one is always water. How are you going to water the animals in the, in the power outage? So looking at if you're going to plan ahead of time when you have horses. So when we talked about uh, having a kit for yourself or your small animals, that's a bit more manageable than looking at uh, what, what to do with your animals. So a, a general best practice in terms of uh, if you're going to shelter in place for a little bit, if there's a power outage or something or ice storm, having enough water for at least three days um, is a good idea. Now that can be really problematic if you have a large number of horses. So it's it's just thinking of is that you know practical or how how could you make that work? Um, I know a few years ago there was an ice storm and our director she has two horses but she had to to leave her property. And, um, and she had to stay at a local hotel, but she had to bring in water for her two horses, of course, every day and just in, you know, big, you know, white pail buckets from the hotel. And uh, she, that was the system that she had to do, but having a plan of what to do. So uh, best practice is enough water for at least three days. Feed is recommended. You look at seven days um, for hay. Um, and it could be something like um, you do, you may not normally use say round bales and we have, you know, there's some concern with round bales in terms of, um, uh, air quality and mold and, and how they're stored, but you might decide to have something on site that's maybe as your emergency forage. Um, it could be something that you maybe don't plan to use, but it could be something that in the event of an emergency, you have something, um, or it could be the large, the large, very large hay bales. Um, and looking at concentrates and feeds. Same for bedding, it's recommended uh, having seven days supply um, is, a, is a good safety measure. When we look at uh, water is the big thing. So when we talked about power outages, especially with the dairy farms, um, daily water requirement. So this is just to give an idea of with average livestock. So a milking cow, um, it's 
you know, 68 to you know 150 liters. A beef cow obviously is less. Horses are about 30 to 60 liters. So, and again, if you have poultry, um, so again, just having an idea of what's going to happen with if you can't supply the daily water in your normal fashion, um, it could be a big, big problem. So getting back to a little bit of the horse owner responsibilities, I think I've said about training your horse, uh, making sure that your horse can load, um, can be caught, um, is maybe used to different kinds of halters, and maybe you're used to putting on different kinds of halters, um, and is safe to work around a vet. Looking at your farm, overall farm safety. Um, we didn't get into a lot about trailer safety, but that's another area to look at. Fire prevention is a big one, um, emergency preparedness and risk assessments. So I think we're going to share, or you've, you'll share the slides, but there's a really good video series. So it's called BIVA, which is the British, Equi I guess it's Equine Vet Association. And they have this great um, video series that's called Don't Break Your Vet. And it's, uh, it's all about techniques to, um, uh, to help horse owners with their horses to make sure that they can be clipped, given wormers, vaccinations, trailering. So it's just, it's really important to consider again um, that your animal is really good to work with. Um, and, there, and this is a really good little video series that um, can be helpful. And they do a lot of, um, they give a lot of examples with clicker training um, to, to help with some animals. So some of the opportunities that we have that are available to you as I mentioned earlier, um, I work at Equine Guelph on campus. Um, actually, well, I lied, I'm not on campus that often, but there's a building there. A lot of our stuff is online, so you have access to it. Um, so our website, we have a whole range of tools, online tools. There is a fire prevention resource and online tool. Um, the, we also have a whole range of online tools in other areas. So say, for example, colic prevention, um, senior horse management, we just have all these great interactive tools that are just free and available to everybody on our website. Um, we also have, I mentioned short courses. So we do have a short course on fire prevention and emergency preparedness. It's a one week long course. We usually run it uh, we don't usually run a lot of courses in summer, so uh, this one is running next, I think it's in the fall. Um, and I've mentioned before or earlier, but large animal rescue training, um, that's another area that we do is, is targeted towards first responders, but um, horse owners and, and livestock industry people can get involved with it as well. It's just it's dealing with at a larger scale what to do with emergency situations. So say, for example, um, could be a barn fire, but even things like um, um, a trailer rollover, how is the fire department gonna best deal with an animal that's trapped um, in a well, anything like that. And it could be not just horses, we also deal with other livestock as well. So again, yeah, of course, fire preventions can be, or fires can be prevented. Uh, a really good, um, again, on our website, a top 10 checklist. So if you go to equinegulf.ca, as part of our interactive tool, it's a top 10 looking at both inside and outside of your barn. And you can go through, it's a little interactive, and you can just do an assessment of both the inside and outside of your property. And that's, sorry, that's, yeah, equinegulf.ca is where you'll find a lot of those tools. And that's a little, a little screenshot of the barn fire prevention tool. And again, this is um, a screenshot of the interactive. So again, you just go in, do your interactive both, both inside and outside of your facility, and you'll get a good assessment. I mentioned earlier, we have the horseportal.ca. So this is a website that we have where we offer online courses. Um, both on demand and also short courses. Our next one is actually coming up 
April 25th is the first offering of our sport horse injury lameness prevention and care course. But as I said, we have a wide range. We have a senior horse course, senior horse course in the fall, horse care and welfare, which is more like a code of practice course. We have a biosecurity sickness prevention. We just finished a forage course. Um, we have a first aid course, uh, behavior and safety. We have for youth, we have an on-demand youth course that's for 13 to 17 year olds. And an important one that actually came up with the pandemic is a business course. So looking at um, uh, how businesses, how horse stables can operate as businesses. Um, a lot of people get in, are involved with horse stables because they love horses and they may not have a strong business background. And a, a lot of our horse stables do run into trouble running as businesses. So having a good solid business sort of 101 background is really essential for running a successful um, stable. We also have our kids program, which is called Equimania. Um, it has an online presence, but we our strength is we have a really large display that goes normally from event to event. Um, obviously we haven't in the last couple of years, um, but as this, as this changes, there's gonna be lots of opportunities. If you want to get involved with our, uh, the events, you're more than welcome to volunteer with us. So normally we're always at the Royal Winter Fair. That's our big one. We're always at the Can-Am Equine Show, which is normally in April. Um, and then we also do a range of other fairs and special events, and we're always looking for volunteers. Um, if you are interested in interacting with people and teaching them uh, about horses, we have uh, a whole range of opportunities for you. So you can either contact me or, or go to our website. And you know, when, when we are hopefully cross fingers, we're at the Royal this November, um, we'll see. <laughs> I sort of learned last couple of years, I, there's no for sure. So I'll just say hopefully, <laughs> but whenever we are available at these events, it, you know, you're, we, we definitely need volunteers and you can really show, share your passion and what you've learned and share it with others. Um, especially at events like the Royal is great because um, a lot of the kids and young adults coming through are from the city and they may not have even handled horses before and just, uh, you know, uh, showing them some things is, is really rewarding to have those kind of interactions with people that, you know, haven't are sort of in awe of these animals that we may handle every day. Um, so it's, it's just, it's a great opportunity. And lastly, again, if you do have any questions, um, whether it's about the topics that we talked about this morning or broader, uh, you're more than welcome to reach out to me or um, those at Equine Guelph. Uh, we have a lot of resources that I think uh, that you can make use of.